More than 160 of his patients died under suspicious circumstances. Of those, 132 left him money or other valuables in their wills. He was tried only for the murder of a single patient, but the prosecution botched the case, possibly on purpose. Some may argue that John Bodkin Adams was the Dr. Kevorkian of his time, providing relief for patients suffering from slow, agonizing deaths, but evidence suggests something more sinister. Shortly after graduating from Queen's University in Belfast, Adams started working under surgeon Arthur Rendell Short, who offered him a position as assistant houseman at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Adams spent a year there, but did not prove to be successful. On Short's advice, Adams applied for a job as a general practitioner in Eastbourne. Adams moved in with his mother and cousin in Eastbourne, Sussex in 1922. In 1929, he borrowed enough money from a patient, William Mawhood, to buy Kent Lodge, an 18-room house in an upscale neighborhood. Adams would frequently invite himself to the Mawhood's residence at mealtime, even bringing his mother and cousin. He also began charging items to their accounts at local stores without their permission. When Mr. Mawhood died in 1949, Adams visited his widow uninvited and took a 22 karat gold pen from her bedroom dressing table, saying he wanted something of her husband's. He never visited her again. Gossip regarding Adams' unconventional methods had started by the mid-1930s. In 1935, Adams inherited the majority of his patient, Matilda Witten's estate, roughly $700,000 in today's money. The will was contested by her relatives, but upheld in court. In 1941, Adams earned his diploma in anesthetics and worked at a local hospital, where he acquired a reputation for incompetence. He would fall asleep during operations, eat cakes, count money, and even mix up the anesthetic gas tubes, leading to patients waking up during operations or even turning blue. Adams' career was very successful nonetheless, and by 1956, he was considered one of the wealthiest general practitioners in England. He provided care for some of the most famous and influential people of the area, including a host of royals, politicians, and wealthy businessmen. On July the 23rd, 1956, Eastbourne Police received an anonymous call about a death. It turned out to be from Leslie Henson, the famous musical comedian whose friend Gertrude Hullett had died suspiciously while being treated by Adams. Adams was arrested in December of 1956. Detective Herbert Hannon of Scotland Yard collected enough evidence for at least four cases, which included the deaths of Clara Neal Miller, Julia Bradnam, Edith Morell, and Gertrude Hullett. Of these, Adams was charged on only one count, the murder of Edith Morell, which turned out to be the weakest case of the bunch. Was somebody trying to help Adams win his case? Testimonies gathered during Detective Hannum's investigation suggested a pattern of Adams pumping his elderly patients full of drugs, persuading them to put him in their wills, and then walking off with their prized possessions while they lay ailing. Adams was known to abscond with anything from a bottle of alcohol to clocks and jewelry, and would often make attempts to isolate patients from their friends and relatives and manipulated his way into the wills of 132 of his patients. In 1939, another physician was brought in to tend to a patient that had grown incoherent due to the massive amounts of drugs that Adams had administered. After eight weeks under the new physician's care, the patient was back to normal. In 1952, Adams delivered an overdose of medication to a woman who was suffering from depression after the death of her cat. 
While she was on her deathbed, Dr. Adams made off with her typewriter. In November of 1956, Adams tended to one of the key witnesses in the case, Annie Sharp, to whom he administered a large amount of morphine and Demerol. Sharp died suddenly and was cremated before an investigation into her death could be conducted. Conspiracy or just poor handling of the trial? What do you think? There is considerable evidence to suggest that the trial was sabotaged by political interests. In the lead up to the trial, Lord Chief Justice Goddard was seen dining at a hotel with a defendant's suspected lover, Sir Roland Gwynn, former mayor of Eastbourne. And though it was Gertrude Hullett's death that spurred police investigation, Morell's death was chosen for prosecution despite the fact that little evidence remained and the body had long been cremated. Detectives Hannum and Hewitt were astounded at Prosecutor Manningham Bullard's decision to charge Adams with the murder of Morell, believing it to be the weakest case possible. In November of 1956, Prosecutor Manningham Buller handed a copy of Detective Hannum's 187-page report to the president of the British Medical Association, the Doctors' Trade Union in Britain. This document, the basis for the prosecution's entire case, was now in the hands of the defense, a situation that led the Home Secretary to reprimand Prosecutor Manningham Bullard harshly. After the not guilty verdict on the count of murdering Morell, the prosecutor, Manningham Buller, had the power to try Adams for the death of Hollett, but chose not to. This despite the prosecutor's usual reputation for being a hard-nosed bully with the nickname of Sir Bullying Manor. Adams was found guilty in a later trial for 13 instances of prescription fraud, lying on cremation forms, obstructing a police search, and failing to keep a dangerous drug register. He was removed from the medical register in 1957, but reinstated four years later without ever having to serve a day in prison. So who might have helped him with his case? Harold Macmillan, prime minister during the time of Adam's trial, shared an unusual connection with Adams. In 1950, Macmillan's brother-in-law, the Duke of Devonshire, died of a heart attack while Adams tended to him. The Duke had not seen a doctor in the 14 days before his death, which should have been reported to officials, though Adams was able to fill out the death certificate so that this wasn't necessary. Some suspect that Macmillan had been concerned about drawing attention to his wife, the Duke's sister, who was having an affair with a member of Parliament. There were also concerns coming from the National Health Service. Adams' case was very important for the medical profession at the time. The NHS had just been founded in 1948 and by 1956 was stretched financially with many doctors dissatisfied with their conditions. A doctor sentenced to death would have led to mass defection from the service over fear of being hanged for prescribing medication. In December 1956, the police acquired a memorandum belonging to a Daily Mail journalist concerning rumors of homosexuality between a police officer, a magistrate, and a doctor, with the doctor being Adams. This revealed Adams' close connections to those in power of Eastbourne at the time. The magistrate was Sir Roland Gwynne, Gwyn was Adam's patient and known to visit every morning at nine. They went on frequent holidays together and had spent three weeks in Scotland that September. Detective Hannum chose to ignore this line of investigation, preferring to concentrate on the more salient aspects of this case. As for Adams, 
He was reinstated as a general practitioner in November of 1961 and was able to once again prescribe controlled substances in July of the following year. He continued to practice in Eastbourne despite the common belief around town that he was a murderer. Roland Gwynn, Adam's presumed lover, publicly distanced himself from the doctor, though it was Adams who signed Gwynn's death certificate when he passed away in 1971. Adams applied for an American visa in 1962, but was turned down due to his fraud convictions. He became president of the British Clay Pigeon Shooting Association and later died at the age of 84 after injuring himself during a shooting accident in 1983. Researchers now suspect him of murdering at least eight people and as many as 163. Dr. Jane Mercer, pathologist at Eastbourne District General Hospital, reviewed Edith Morell's case from a modern perspective after Adam's files were released from police archives in 2003. She decided that while there was no conclusive evidence that would have proven Adam's guilt in court from the case submitted, she was convinced that Dr. Adams had made at least one attempt to kill Mrs. Morell. So what do you think? Was John Bodkin Adams the Dr. Kevorkian of his time or something far more nefarious? preying on the generosity of his elderly patients before ultimately murdering them. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this story, please consider leaving a like. I'll be posting new stories every week. Be sure to subscribe so you won't miss the next one.